Worship team. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Life E Free. Happy Easter to all of you. So glad that you're here uh, with us this morning, as Ron said, to worship our risen Savior together. Great to see you. What a beautiful morning that the Lord has given us this morning. Amen. I'm actually going to just bypass announcements this morning, but would you take a look at the bulletin, please? There's several uh, good ones for you to see in there of just things coming up in our church body. So I'm just going to let you read that this morning, and we will continue in a, a spirit of worship here. I'm going to have Jim come forward, if you would, Jim, and uh, he is going to lead us in the reading of God's Word and prayer. We will then uh, sing a couple more songs together in worship. We'll have communion together, and then we will open God's Word. So thank you, Jim. This morning, I'm opening in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, 1 through 18, the empty tomb. So our Gospel of John, start, or chapter 20, 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been, 
one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabone, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to, to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he, had, that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're here before you this morning to, to give you glory, to give you the praise you so, you so deserve. For Jesus... Your, your great love for us was shown when you died on the cross and rose from the dead. We're here to just glorify you. And Father, I pray that your church, that this church may be more than the people of the cross. May we be known as the people of the empty tomb. It is there that our hope is found. Father, we, I, we pray that as, as we go out from here, that the, the spirit of the living Christ is, is shown through us because Jesus, our risen Savior, is where our joy is. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you stand with us again as we sing a couple more songs? First one, Hallelujah for the Savior. <coughs>
ancient song. Let it ring on and on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up a joyful sound. Crown him with many crowns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up some ancient song. worship team. What a joy it is to be able to come together now uh, here on Easter Sunday and celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together, communion, the Lord's table. As we do this, let me just remind you, um, we practice what what some churches, I've heard the term, uh, open communion, and, and what that means is you do not need to be a member here or even a regular attender here at New Life to participate in communion with us. What we ask of you is what we believe the scriptures are clear in setting forth, and that is that you are uh, a child of God, 
that you are saved and in Christ, that you can uh, sing those lyrics and know that it is true of yourself, that your lips can repeat, Jesus died my soul to save, that you can know, you do know, that your sin has been made white as snow. And maybe one of my favorite lines in there, that, that his power and his alone has melted your heart of stone. If you know that's true of you, if you have trusted in Christ for your salvation, forgiveness of sin, we would invite you to participate with us. I'm going to have the men come up in, in just a moment. I have a story for you that I'd like to share first. Uh, but then when they come, we'll pass out the bread and then take it all together. We'll then do the same with the cup. So as you get it, if you just want to hold on to it, we will participate together. But I ran across this story that I'd like to share with you. It's an Easter story. It was uh, too good to pass up. I didn't, I didn't fit it into our study here in a few moments uh, from God's Word, but I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll read it during communion. It says this, It was Easter Sunday morning, and the Reverend Al uh, Alfred H. Ackley was getting ready for the service at his Presbyterian church in California. The year was 1932, and radio was the great communicator. Reverend Ackley had tuned in and was listening to the various local programs when suddenly the announcer said, we now join the complete red and blue networks, which is now, it notes, NBC and ABC, for a special program coming to you from New York City. The speaker introduced was a well-known preacher from New York City who was known for his liberal thinking, and this morning he greeted the radio audience with, Good morning, it's Easter. You know, folks, it really doesn't make any difference to me if Christ be risen or not. As far as I'm concerned, his body could be as dust in some Palestinian tomb. The main thing is his truth goes marching on. <laughs> it's a lie yelled Reverend Ackley, forgetting that the speaker on the radio could not hear him, and also oblivious to the fact that he was shaving with a straight razor and could cut himself. But Mrs. Ackley did hear and asked him, why are you shouting so early in the morning? <laughs> Mr. Ackley chuckled as he told me this story, told the author this story. Didn't you hear what that good-for-nothing preacher just said, he replied to his wife. He said it didn't matter whether Christ be risen or not. That morning, Mr. Ackley told me that he preached as he had never quite preached before. For several weeks, he had been talking to a young Jewish man who had asked, why should I worship a dead Jew? Reverend Ackley had replied, that's the whole point. He isn't dead. He's alive. And, and yet now this preacher on the radio had dared with one fell swoop to try to destroy that which had given the early church its power and for which many had given their lives to proclaim a resurrected living Savior. When Sunday evening came around, said the Reverend Ackley, I gave them the second barrel. And when that service was over, I had gotten home and I still hadn't said all that I planned to say. My wife sized up the situation and said, Listen here, Alfred Ackley. It's time, don't you love the wife? It's time that you did which you, that which you could do best. Why don't you just write a song about it, and then maybe you'll feel better. Then you'll have something that will go on telling the story. Heeding her advice, said Ackley, I went to my study. I once again turned to the resurrection story in Mark 16 and reread the words, He is risen, he is not here. A thrill filled my soul, a glorious experience I will never forget. As I thought of the reality of his everlasting presence right there with me in the room, I could hold back no longer and began to write. On and on I wrote until within a comparatively short time, all the stanza lines and thoughts had fallen into place. Then as I sat down at the piano, the words and melody of the chorus immediately followed just as they are today. And if you 
find a hymnal and turn in your hymnal, you will find the great song of our faith called He Lives by Reverend H. A. H. Ackley. And he wrote, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men on the radio might say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. And do you remember the chorus? He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives where? Remember? Within my heart. I'd like to ask Connie and uh, Jim and Billy if you guys would come forward at this time, please. Lord, we thank you for the risen Savior. And we participate now in that which you left your church on the night of your betrayal. On this past Thursday night, if, if you will. You said, this is my body, this is my blood. These elements, the bread, the juice represent my body, my blood, which is freely given for our salvation. Do this why and how in remembrance of me we do this now lord remembering the cross and remembering the empty tomb in jesus name amen amen Jim, would you return thanks for the bread, please? Heavenly Father, again, you showed, you showed your great love with Jesus coming down, dying, rising, but Taking on our sin is what is what you did. They hated you. They, they beat you, hung you on the cross, your body broken. But we do this in remembrance of you. 
of what you did for us by taking our sin upon, upon yourself that we can live with you for eternity. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Billy, would you return thanks for the cup, please? Dear Lord, we thank you that we can, uh, the sweet, sweet thing you've called us to do is to remember uh, uh, that we have been washed uh, by the your son, Lord Jesus. How precious that is that we can come to the cross, uh, lay our burdens, Lay our brokenness, lay our striving, and uh, be washed white as snow, and uh, walk in newness of life uh, by this wonderful uh, gift of uh, uh, being restored to you through your Son. This we give thanks to you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Scripture says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
Hope that maybe you got some notes on your way in to the sanctuary this morning. If you want to grab those, I believe they're green colored. We come to our time in God's Word now this morning. We are taking a pause today in our study of the book of Judges. We will, Lord willing, pick that up next Sunday. We are ready for, uh, by the way, Judges chapter 10, which is about the halfway point of the study of that book. So we will do that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But this morning, we continue to turn our attention to the events of the resurrection of Jesus as we are gathered here together on this beautiful, beautiful Easter Sunday morning. This past week, I <clears throat> re-watched one of my favorite depictions of the life of Christ. The Passion of the Christ is good, the movie, though very difficult to watch. Uh, some of you have been following along and watching The Chosen as it comes out. Amy and I have been enjoying that as well. We have some catching up to do. But in my mind, nothing has yet to surpass uh, my favorite, which is the 1977 TV miniseries called Jesus of Nazareth. I don't know how many times I've watched it. It's been a lot. Uh, oftentimes, I will try to watch it during Easter week. I haven't done that every year, but I, I got to once again this year. And as I watch it, you, uh, as you might expect, the same scenes stand out to me and are meaningful to me. But it also seems each time I watch it, as it is perhaps with any movie or show, something different uh, seems to strike me each time. This time, this last week, one of the things that struck me was that surrounding Jesus' entire life was death. It is believed that Jesus lived to be about the age of 33 before his crucifixion. But in those relatively short years, 33, he was surrounded by death. Of course, we know that he ministered to those who were touched by death. He raised the widow's son back to life. He raised Jairus' daughter to life. We know that people close to him died. For example, his friend Lazarus, who he then also raised. Uh, Jesus, if you think about it, also lived through the murder of John the Baptist, the one who was so closely tied to his own ministry. I think oftentimes we forget that it is believed that Jesus lived through the death of his father, his earthly father, Joseph. What must that have been like for him? And then what struck me this year as I watched that movie was the death of the young boys in Bethlehem. King Herod, in an effort to stamp out the Messiah, brutally murdered every boy aged two and under in that town. And I thought to myself, I don't know if I've ever stopped to think about how Jesus must have felt about that. The fact that all those innocent boys were killed in connection with him and his ministry. And then, of course, we have the reality of his own death that he went through. Jesus' life here on this earth was surrounded by the pain and the sting of death. And yet, as we gather here together on Easter morning, our focus is on life. <laughs> this Jesus of Nazareth died, and then he rose up out of the grave alive again. The one who is God in the flesh, God with us, came out of the tomb. That is the message we proclaim today, but what does that all mean? What difference does that make? One of the popular songs of our faith today says this, death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave, the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again. What difference does the empty tomb make in our lives today? On Friday night, if you were with us or perhaps watched later online, we asked that question about the cross, and we noted seven differences that the cross makes in our lives. This morning, we're looking at the same number, seven, only for the empty tomb. 
We're going to walk through seven differences that the resurrection of Jesus has for us. I would tell you, like Friday night's list, our list this morning is not exhaustive. Please don't think that it is. There are certainly more differences that we could mention this morning. But we will look at these seven together and be reminded of the powerful impact of what we celebrate here together this morning on what we call Easter Sunday. Father, open our hearts to your word this morning. We will be in several different places. I pray that the power of your word would go forth and Holy Spirit that you would bring conviction and comfort and rebuke and encouragement, training in righteousness, teaching. Heavenly Father, we look to you for these things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the powerful truths we're looking at today. And Father, I just want to pray for my brothers and sisters in this area, Tama County, Marshall County, Powershoot, Benton. Father, as your people gather, I pray that your word would uh, go out and, and be spoken faithfully and clearly. And Lord, for any person including in our room, but, but any person in our area who does not know Jesus as their Savior, and yet they're finding themselves hearing about the resurrection. Oh, Father, I pray that you would draw them to yourself and pray for their salvation this morning. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. Amen. All right, let's begin our list together, a list of seven with this. Write this down if you're taking notes. The empty tomb proves the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. What difference does it make? The empty tomb proves the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. There are those who have noted, and I agree with them, that the question of Jesus in Luke 9 is the most important question that you can ask yourself and answer. And Jesus asked there in Luke 9, Who do men say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you believe that he is? It's the most important question you will answer. Down through the centuries, the answers to that question are all over the place. Even in the Gospels, we see differences of opinion. The disciples in Luke 9 answer Jesus' question, uh, that men believe that he was John the Baptist or Elijah, or they said one of the prophets from long ago. Uh, he's some other person. This is what all three of those have in common. Some other person now come back to us. That's what they were saying. At other places in the Gospels, we see that people view him as simply Joseph's son. They couldn't get past his known background. Or... Some even claim that he was operating through the power of Satan himself. In our day today, Jesus is seen by some as simply a good man or a good teacher. In fact, I was mildly disappointed. In fact, mildly, I shouldn't even use that word. I was disappointed this morning as I ate my um, cereal. I forget which kind it was. And had my coffee I pulled up an interview by the actor who played Jesus in that series I watched, Jesus of Nazareth, and the person asked him, who do you believe Jesus to be after playing that role? Answer, a very good man. The best of men to have ever lived. I was disappointed. Many today say that Jesus is simply, simply a good man or a good teacher. He's a miracle worker, perhaps, or a religious leader. And what comes to my mind when I hear that claim of good man is what C.S. Lewis famously said, that the only options we have when it comes to the identity of Jesus of Nazareth are the following, liar, lunatic, or what? Lord. Lewis said, he did not leave us the option of just saying he is a good man. You either have to believe he is an absolute liar or that he is out of his mind or that he is exactly who he says he is. God in the flesh, 
God with us. And the point of me saying all of this, folks, is that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead proves his identity. It proves that he is who he said he is. Listen to Romans 4, uh, 1, 4. It should be on the screen for you. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God. That's identity. In power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his what? Resurrection from the dead. Jesus is declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. When the stone was rolled away and Jesus came out alive again, it was a declaration that he is indeed God with us, God in the flesh. The debate over the identity of Jesus is settled at the empty tomb. S. Lewis Johnson was a former professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, and he said this, the resurrection is God's amen to Christ's statement on the cross. It is finished. That's good, isn't it? I like that. He's saying that the resurrection is a confirmation. It is a confirmation that Jesus did what he said he would do. More on that in a minute. And confirmation that Jesus is who he said he is. The resurrection proves that Jesus is the Son of God. Write this down, number two. The resurrection demonstrates Jesus' victory over sin and death. His victory over sin and death. We just mentioned this. It confirms his work. Now we're putting it this way. It demonstrates his victory over sin and death. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, one of the primary resurrection passages in God's word. Uh, Paul is speaking here of our bodies, okay, at the beginning. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, the power of sin is the law. Listen, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, folks, the text says death is swallowed up in victory. The sting of death is sin, but now that sting is gone, it says. Why? Why the victory over sin and death? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through the resurrection of Jesus, which, by the way, is the entire context of that chapter, that we have gained victory over sin and death through him in his victory. Listen to the great words of uh, the Easter song of our faith. Death cannot keep his prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the, can you hear the chorus? Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ the Lord. Christ's resurrection is a victory statement. He has won the battle over our most dreaded enemies, sin and death. The resurrection is a confirmation statement. It confirmed that Jesus indeed died to take my sin on himself, which is what he claimed. I thought to myself this week, you know, anyone could claim, anyone could claim that so-and-so's death paid for our sin. <laughs> you can make that claim. Anyone could say, hey, so-and-so will be the payment against our sin that God requires. Anyone could say, well, I, I think Confucius died for our sin. You can say that. Or I think Muhammad died for our sins. Or I think John Lennon died for our sins. Or Walt Disney died for our sins. Or Kobe Bryant paid it all. Anybody could just say that about somebody's passing. Here's my point. How do we know? How do we know that Jesus of Nazareth died for our sin and was the sacrifice we needed for our sin? How do we know that the whole death on the cross thing 
worked? And the answer is we know that it worked because he rose from the dead. No other person or leader of a world religion claimed that they would rise from the dead. No other followers of a religion claimed that their leader and founder are alive and well. They're all what? Dead. Muhammad is dead. Confucius is dead. Buddha is dead. Those who founded Hinduism, and if I'm correct on this, we still really don't know who that was. They're all dead. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, is dead. Lafayette Hubbard, who founded Scientology, is dead. All the leaders of the cults from previous years, James Jones, David Koresh, they're all what? They're dead. But Jesus is, say it, alive. Jesus stands alone as the risen Savior. And listen, it confirms that he did exactly what he said he was going to. He died in your place, in my place, to bear the wrath of God against sin upon himself. And the resurrection is that victory confirmation of our worst enemies, sin and death. So, we've gone through two. The resurrection confirms his identity. It confirms his work. Write this down. Number three, the resurrection assures us of our resurrection. What difference does it make? Why do we sit here and sing about it and talk about it and worship the one who came out of the tomb? It assures your resurrection. This is to say, loved ones, that that last point that we just made applies to me. <laughs> that the resurrection of Jesus means victory over sin and death for me. Listen to 2 Corinthians 4. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and we also speak. Listen. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Do you hear it? We know, Paul says, that he who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise us and bring us into God's presence. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Christian who lived in Germany during World War II. And he was one who recognized early on the dangers of what Hitler was promoting and doing in his home country. And so Bonhoeffer dedicated the rest of his life to encourage the church of Germany in that dark season. His efforts led him to being thrown into a concentration camp, which is where he was in the spring of 1945. And of course, also happening in the spring of 1945, if you know your history, the Allied forces began to get ever so closer to Berlin and to ultimate victory. And so the Nazis began to empty the concentration camps, forcing the prisoners to march on foot, including Bonhoeffer, to escape the Allies they ended up killing many of them along the way, but Bonhoeffer himself survived several days on foot. Then came Easter, 1945, April 1st that year. And for the first time, isn't this interesting, on the first time, for the first time on Easter Sunday, it is recorded that Bonhoeffer and those with him could hear the Allied guns in the distance. They could hear their hope of victory and freedom that close on the horizon. But they continued to march on, forced at gunpoint. Yet Bonhoeffer, in all of this, would lead the fellow prisoners in a Bible study each day. Eight days later, on April 9th, 1945, which is today, isn't it? Is this the 9th? Isn't that something? April 9th, 1945. As he was leading the Bible study, a Nazi guard grabbed Bonhoeffer and led him away and shot him. For no other reason than to just continue their evil until the bitter end. A fellow prisoner later, uh, who, was, who made it out, later shared Bonhoeffer's last words as he was led away eight days after Easter on this day, how many years ago? He turned to his friends as he was leaving and said, this is the end but for me, the beginning of life. 
This is the end of my time with you, but for me, the beginning of life. Easter, folks. He had celebrated Easter eight days <coughs> excuse me, earlier, and he knew that though he die, yet shall he live. And that day was the beginning of his life. He knew because Jesus rose, so will I. Easter is our victory. Easter is the key. We know, Paul says, that he who raised Jesus from the dead will raise us also and bring us into God's presence. Now, you might say, wow, that's wonderful. Everyone is getting eternal life. Everyone's going to heaven. <laughs> Isn't that great? Oh, but friend, God's word is clear that this reality is only for those who trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen carefully to Jesus' words in John 11, one of my favorite verses. I am the resurrection and the life Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall they live. Who is the one that will have Jesus' resurrection applied to them? Who is the one who will rise and live just like Jesus, though they die? The one who believes. This past week, I was visiting with Don Chilcote. And he was sitting in his recliner at home. This is before he went to the nursing home later in the week. He's battling pancreatic cancer, a dear brother, and his wife in our church body. And Don is ready to go home. Don is ready to be with, with Jesus. But this past week, I said to him, Don, it's Easter Sunday coming up this Sunday. And understandably so, that's something that had not quite been on his radar. But it led us to talk about the resurrection of Jesus and all that it means for him. We read the resurrection account in Matthew's gospel, and we talked about how that account, that truth, impacts Don right now. Right now, in his house, in his recliner, in Belle Plaine, 2,000 years later. That because Jesus rose and because Don has trusted in Christ, he too shall live, though he dies. Don told me he came to the point in his life at a young age through the faithful ministry of a Sunday school teacher. where he recognized his debt of sin against God that he could never pay. But Don believed that Jesus is God in the flesh and that on that cross, Jesus took the wrath of God against sin, including his own sin. And that he rose from the dead, gaining Don's victory over sin and death. And because Don believes and trusts Christ alone, he knows, he knows, even though his own mortality is right before him. He knows that though he die, yet shall he live. As we gather here today to, excuse me, celebrate Easter, we remember this third difference. We remember that when that time comes for you, when it comes for me, when we're in the recliner, <laughs> you too can have that same peace and confidence that if you believe upon Christ, you too shall live and rise though you die. The resurrection of Jesus assures us of our resurrection. Let's keep going. Number four, jot this down. What difference does the resurrection make? <laughs> Number four, it assures, assures the believer of their body to come. I love this one. It assures you, believer, of your body to come. Listen to Philippians 3. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body 
by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Do you hear it in there? This is to say, loved ones, that when we rise like Jesus rose, as was our last point, when that happens, we will have a glorified body like Jesus's. Philippians says that he will transform our lowly body to be like his. The resurrection of Jesus shows us the kind of body the believer will have. Isn't that a great difference that it makes? When you celebrate Easter and consider Jesus' state that he rose in, we can celebrate that that will be us. Look at this. Now, <clears throat> we could spend a long time talking about what Jesus' body was like. We could talk about what we see in the Gospels. He seems to appear and disappear at will. He ate, right? Fish on the beach with some of the disciples. He could be touched, Thomas, right? He walked on the road with the two to Emmaus. There's a physicality to the body, that's the point. He could be recognized by those who had seen him before death and knew him, and yet there perhaps seems to be some sort of way that he could hide his identity at times. We could go on and on talking about some of those aspects, but I simply want to draw your attention to the words of Philippians, which is still up there. Our lowly bodies will be made glorious. That's all we really need to know, isn't it? These bodies that are subject to sin and death and decay will be now fit for eternity. These bodies that are subject to pain and illness and disease will be free from all of that. Think about it. No more back pain. <laughs> Amy and I spent uh, about four hours yesterday working outside in the yard. And I'm ready for that new body, let me tell you. No more bronchitis or the flu or allergies or diabetes. No more arthritis, broken bones, cavities or sciatica. No more x-rays or MRIs or ultrasounds or shots. Praise the Lord. No more fatigue and sleepless nights, and sleep apnea. Listen, our lowly bodies will be made glorious. Charles Wesley put it this way in another great Easter song of our faith. Soar we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head, made like Him. There it is. Like Him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the sky. What difference does Easter make if you are a born-again follower of Jesus? Easter is a picture of your future. Your resurrected body is not like Lazarus's or the body of the widow's son or the body of Jairus' daughter. They were all resurrected by Jesus, but they lived their lives and they what? They died again. No, Philippians says that your future body, believer, will be like Jesus' glorious body, fit for eternity. Jot this down, number five. The resurrection of Jesus means that the believer has new life in Christ now. New life in Christ now. You might say, well, those last two that we've talked about, that's all future stuff. My resurrection, my new body, that's all down the road when I die. But what about now? What does the resurrection of Jesus offer this life? And if you're thinking of that, that's a worthy question. And that's the one we want to address right now with this fifth point. And here's what we're saying. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth for the believer means that you have new life in Christ now, in this life. Listen to Paul's words in Romans and then Galatians. He wrote both of them. For if we have been united with him in his death, or death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. 
Listen, folks, in the New Testament, there is this connection between the death and resurrection of Jesus and the change in the life of the believer right now. Paul says that if you have trusted in Christ for salvation, you have been crucified with Christ. Your sin, the penalty of your sin, the power of your sin in your life to control you, that's all dead. And now, just like Christ rose from the dead, you have new life in Christ. You are alive in Christ. The life you now live, Christ lives in you, he says in Galatians. You have the power to please God and obey him and follow him. Do you see the connection? Christ died and rose again. We died to sin and are alive to Christ. Now, there's this connection in the New Testament. It's a difference. It's a power that affects you right now, believer. Watchman Nee was an impactful, great Chinese pastor, and he put it this way. He said, I love this, our old history ends with the cross, our new history begins with the resurrection. And Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest, he wrote that. He says, I can have the resurrection life of Jesus here and now. What does it look like? It will exhibit itself through hope. Christ in you. We have mostly been talking about Easter's future impact on the believer, but now hear this truth, loved ones. The resurrection of Jesus gives you a new identity now. When you believe upon Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to reside in you. You are dead to the power of sin in your life, reflecting Christ's death. You are alive to Christ now, reflecting his resurrection. Just a couple more to go. Write this down, number six. The resurrection of Jesus means our loved ones in Christ who have died live. This is another great one. Our loved ones who have died in Christ live. Do you think of that? On Easter. This is such a meaningful reality of Easter. Do you consider this when this season rolls around? Does it cross your mind this time of year if you are a believer and if that loved one who died was a believer? Yet because of the resurrection of Jesus, they live and I will see them again in Christ. Where does this idea come from? Listen to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep or dead, that you may not grieve as others who, do ha uh, who have no hope. For since we believe, listen, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, just the same, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have. Listen, because you believe that Jesus rose, you have to believe that God has those believers who have already died, and he will bring them with him. Since Jesus rose, that will happen. Because he lives, so too do those I love who have died in In a previous church where I was a youth pastor, we had an interesting uh, Easter Sunday tradition. We would bring, and the church body would bring Easter lilies on Easter Sunday and place them all around the front of stage, if you will, up front. And each plant had a card attached to it with someone's name written on it. The idea was that you were supposed to buy a plant, bring it in for Easter, and write someone's name on it who was a believer and they had passed away. Many people, of course, wrote the name of a family member on it who had died in Christ, but some wrote names of friends, including friends from within the church body who had passed away. Now, to be honest with you, my initial reaction to all of this was uh, admittedly a bit negative. 
I thought that maybe it was an unnecessary way to highlight people over Christ and the church, especially on Easter Sunday. But as time went on, I saw the meaning of it and the connection with the point that we're making now. The flowers placed there on Easter Sunday was a way to remember this difference, number six. They were reminding each other in the church that because of this day, because of Easter, because Jesus rose, I will see that person again. This is a physical reminder that that person lives, that they will rise, and because I believe too, I will see them again. Now, we don't have flowers in front of us this morning lining the stage, but who is it that comes to your mind this morning? Who comes to your mind? This is not a mental exercise to think about just anybody. Just anybody. This is to remember those who you know are in Christ. And it is done by those who know that we are in Christ. And where those two things exist and meet, who do you think of this morning? Family member, a friend, person you worshipped with for many years in the local church, a person who impacted your life for Christ and helped you grow, Maybe the person who helped lead you to faith in Christ. In fact, I said to Don as we met this week, I said, Don, you will see that Sunday school teacher again who led you to Christ. And he will, and he knows that because of Easter, because of Jesus' resurrection. Easter is the time to remember that they live and that I will see them again. It is an appropriate point of celebration for us. On Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus means our loved ones who have died in Christ live. Finally, number seven, and we end with this. What difference does the empty tomb make? Jot this down. The resurrection is the supreme example of God turning great sorrow into great joy. The supreme example of God turning great sorrow into great joy. One of the things I uh, love to think about on Easter is the perspective of the 12 disciples. To consider the emotions that they went through from the crucifixion of Jesus to his resurrection, how they must have felt as they watched him die or frankly heard about his death as it seems many of them fled. The grief, the confusion, the sorrow, the disappointment, the dashed dreams for Peter, the sorrow uh, and, and guilt of him disowning Jesus publicly, and now he never has a chance to make that right with his master. How did they feel on that Saturday? You ever wonder that? What was Saturday like for them? I think of that. That long day of relative silence in the scriptures. What did they do on that day? Is it possible that some of them just sat, just sat, hardly able to move because of their grief? Those of you who have been touched by deep sorrow, you know that there are times when you feel like you can just hardly move and stand and get out of bed. The sorrow of the disciples, but, but then <laughs> turn to joy on Sunday, the shock, the bewilderment, the renewed hope, the excitement, the smiles, the fresh courage, and perhaps even laughter of, of joy. The resurrection of Jesus is the supreme example of God being able to turn seasons of pain to yet again seasons of joy. And all of this is an example from the truth in Psalm 35. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes when? In the morning. Isn't Easter the supreme example and outworking of that verse? The sorrow and weeping may be for a night, but with the Lord joy comes 
in the morning. God is able to take the deepest sorrows and turn them into sources of joy. He's able to take seasons of hardship and yet preserve and even restore joy in the Lord. I'll never forget that it was this truth, this truth that we're talking about, that I heard in the late morning hours of September 11, 2001. I was in college at Moody at the time, as was Amy, and all of us students and faculty had eventually found our way to a TV that morning to see the horrible images of that day, towers falling and planes crashing and people fleeing from the city, our own city of Chicago being evacuated in, in many parts and on high alert. We soon learned that classes were canceled for the day, but that we were supposed to gather in the auditorium for an address from our president, Dr. Joe Stoll. Can you imagine, by the way, if you were him, what would you say? I've thought of that often. What would you say? What did he go through in those moments? What would you say to hundreds of young students and, and all of the faculty in the face of something like that when you had this much notice, what am I going to say to the horrors of the day? The fear, the confusion, the uncertainty. I'll never forget what he said. He pointed us to this reality, this reality, the cross and the empty tomb. He spoke of the cross being the worst thing that man ever did. We killed God with us, God in the flesh. We rejected him and mocked him and crucified him. And yet God took that worst event and glorified himself, didn't he? It was all part of his perfect plan. He took the event of deep sorrow and he raised Christ from the dead. And Dr. Stoll encouraged us on September 11th that God is yet in control over these even terrible events. He encouraged us with a reminder that God has the power to take terrible events and use them for his glory. He can take painful things and yet restore and even preserve through it joy. And perhaps we didn't know on that day how all of it would play itself out, and perhaps we never will this side of eternity. But by looking at the death and resurrection of Jesus, we know that God can do this and does do this. He takes painful seasons and restores joy. Weeping may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. It has been observed by others, and I certainly can attest to this myself, that some of the most joyful people in the Lord are those who have been through the deepest pain and grief. I know a sister in the Lord who went through the most unimaginable assault. And yet today she is one of the most joyful believers I know. I know some, including some of you in this room, who have walked through tremendous seasons of death and loss and yet your joy in Christ is contagious to us. There is a paradigm in God's kingdom, it seems, between night and morning. Sorrow in the night and joy in the morning. And the resurrection of Jesus is our supreme example of that paradigm. Here on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Worship team, you can join me now at the front if you will. <laughs> we celebrate Easter, and yet what does it mean? What does it mean? What difference does it make? It confirms Jesus' identity as God in the flesh. It confirms his work. It assures me of my resurrection, if I'm a believer. It's a picture of my future. His body will be mine. It shows me I have new life in Christ now. It means my loved ones in Christ will live. 
and it's a supreme example to me of sorrow turning to joy. It offers me that hope and that perseverance as I walk through the valley, the painful season. We have a lot to celebrate, don't we? And this isn't even an exhaustive look at the meaning of the resurrection, but we stand here in a moment and we sing in worship of the one who makes all of this possible through the empty tomb. Father, we thank you and we lift our voices as we sing this last song, as we stand to our feet in honor of you, if, if we are able. And we worship the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. Thank you for this list that we've walked through, all of these truths communicated to us in your word, and so much more, Lord, um, so much more we could dive into. But we lift our praise to you now, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our last song is In Christ Alone. In Christ alone. Thank you. In Christ Alone. Let's stand together and sing this final song together.